Thank you, Irma. And thanks uh, the prophecy team also for inviting us. Um, would have loved to be there in person, but uh, uh, good news is I'm probably going to raise the level a bit. It's much lighter than the previous two presentations. But the key goal about a presentation is to talk about bringing the time element into uh, vision processing and hence the title, right? So I can skip past this. The only thing I was going to say overall for those that don't know BrainChip, it's uh, the first to commercialize a neuromorphic digital IP platform and reference chip. Um, we are extending that capability with the second generation, especially where we bring in the temporal elements as well as vision transformer elements. Um, and then we are trusted by a number of uh, key partners, such as Megachips, Renesis, and our technologies has been demonstrated by folks like Mercedes. And we're building out our ecosystem and partnership to get people there, OK? So um, let me start with the key technology changes that we're making to support uh, partners like um, Prophecy Innovation and other uh, folks that are building not just event-based solutions, but brain-based solutions and vision. Um, it, most of you have probably seen this before, but just quickly to go through, um, Akita is our um, IP platform that's uh, now getting into the second generation. Uh, the key focal points are, how do we actually make it neuromorphic? How do we make it efficient, but keep it portable across different boundaries, different processes, and make it easy to implement. So it is silicon proven now twice over, but it's a digital neuromorphic implementation, which makes it much more easy to be, um, in, not just implement, but port across different uh, platforms. Um, it is event-based, as you know, right? Um, minimize, and the focus is on minimizing the host CPU usage, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, we are using app memory, we're not looking for custom memories in this discussion. We're looking for standard cell memory, I mean, standard SRAMs configured in and we're designing compute around it, again, to make it easy and portable to implement across uh, our various licenses. Okay. Uh, with having the, the fully connected last layer, we can do on-chip learning, uh, one-shot or few-shot learning, which helps with <laughs> extension of uh, products in the field, customization, but also doing it in a secure and private fashion. And then, of course, as an IP provider, we are making it pretty scalable and configurable, as well as having that capability post-silicon, not just pre-silicon with the configurability, but post-silicon. Okay. So in terms of the architecture itself, um, it, it's effectively designed to sit as a black box on an AXI bus uh, to provide the acceleration to the rest of the chip. Uh, and it consists of two main components, um, uh, at least in terms of compute. One is the uh, uh, event-based uh, neural network node. And in this case, we're also bringing in the temporal event base, which I'll get to in a second. But also, we have a, an optional vision transformer node that we're adding in this generation. All of it connected by a, um, a neural mesh, which is, again, doing the event-based communication, event-based uh, setting across the various uh, nodes in the fabric. Uh, we have a, a pretty advanced DMA that manages um, our processing. And uh, the conversion from traditional uh, networks into spike-based or event-based uh, done by the HRC or uh, high resolution convolution uh, capabilities. One of the key benefits of the way we've done this uh, is that convolution is built into the, the nodes and the fabric, right? So it's not just event-based or not just about spike-based neural nets. It can support standard convolutions uh, standard models that we have today. Uh, and it's designed to do multiple layers at the same time, um, handled through our DMAs that actually offloads the CPU. So with this generation, we're also doing long rate skip connections in hardware, which should increase the amount of, uh, of the complexity of networks we can handle. And we support with this generation also 8-bit along with 4, 2, and 1-bit weights and activations. 
Um, in general, we're trying to keep it intelligent, but simple to engage so that the IP is in a black box uh, and the runtime and the software management is through simple APIs. And just to highlight some of the key benefits that we see from a customer standpoint is that because it can manage the entire network um, in hardware, um, the CPU or the processor doesn't need to do much apart from the initial pre-processing. And then once we're done with all the acceleration and done with the inference, the post-processing. So this actually enables um, our, the accelerator to be combined with a much smaller or less capable CPU even to deliver higher end uh, AI tasks. And in particular, we'll talk about vision in this case. So let's move to the, the big kind of reveal, if you will, right? So in order for us to make um, key uh, improvements in vision processing, um, we want to make sure that our models can understand the physical world better. And in this case, let's use the human inductive biases that we have today, for example. And, and effectively, we're learning with the laws of physics, objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Objects cannot be like teleporting from one spot to the another. So there's continuity. And then, of course, the permanence aspect, which is even if you may not see an object, if it's passing behind the other, um, it is still there, right? These are things that the human brain kind of well understands. And we need to find a way to kind of get this into um, our modeling infrastructure. So we've taken the approach uh, to build in temporally um, um, the integrated, uh, we use time as a key domain. And we also use this to kind of constrain whatever objects that are detected to follow laws of physics. And so effectively, the ML models that we can generate that can efficiently uh, extract and represent these temporal features um, are temporally consistent, right? So that also simplifies the computation. Um, it gives you an, a better understanding of depth of motion and more efficiently so. And hence, as a combination of both of these things, the models themselves can be substantially smaller, faster, but at the same time, uh, precise and accurate. And so you're not going to lose any accuracy or precision by going to this type of model. Um, the basis of what we're doing here um, is the temporal event-based neural net which is a, a, a model that is easy to train. It's extremely data efficient. It trains just like a regular uh, CNN uh, does with that prop propagation. So 3D data is taken as spatial frames and temporal frames, so two and 3D, uh, 2D for spatial, 1D for temporal. Um, trains with back propagation, inference is done in current, you know, recurrent mode. For 1D time series, which is more like a, uh, health signals, audio signals, which are combined with another revision. Similarly, training done with 1D data with back propagation, where the temporal aspects are extracted and the inference done in recurrent mode. And what this does is it delivers similar benefits that you'd expect from the RNNs, LSTMs, GRUs, but it is substantially smaller and more effective in doing that. Um, along with the temporal aspect that we're doing with TNN, uh, another thing that we've added is uh, the vision transformer capability. Uh, and we have focused on building the vision encoder or the transformer encoder. Uh, and so, for example, with two nodes um, at running at 800 megahertz, we can deliver about 800 uh, frames per second perform, I mean, sorry, 30 frames per second performance for the 224, 224 by three uh, configuration. And just like the rest of our nodes, the, uh, it's quite contained once the uh, model's loaded and it's quite small in size. Just to give a context, right, you'll see some of the uh, service uh, support on TNNs shortly in terms of results. Um, in let's say seven nanometer, this, these two nodes running 800 megahertz giving 30 frames per second uh, would take less than 20 milliwatts of uh, energy, right, or power. 
So it's really capable of doing uh, much more full-fledged revision capability in a very small edge environment. So going over to results, this is highlighting the capabilities of uh, TNNs, right? So the temporal event-based neural nets. In this case, uh, with the prophecy event camera road scene uh, data set. Uh, Prophecy, you know, has published a lot of good data uh, in that they kind of demonstrated with gray retina at a mean average precision of about 43% effectively, but a large model, about 33 uh, million parameters and about 2.4 million racks per second. Uh, with the Akita TNN, right, you can build a, a much, much smaller model, which is 1 50th the size in terms of parameters, 1 30th in size in terms of actual operations that need to be performed while actually increasing the precision, right? Um, so it really lends itself to bring, building much more compact models, which are ideal for the edge, and yet not losing precision, actually gaining precision in the process. Um, now, taking the Kitty 2D data set, uh, again, for road scenes, now using SimCLR with the ResNet 50 backbone, uh, you got an average precision of about 57. With the Akita 10s, with CenterNet, we can get at least the same level of precision, but substantially fewer parameters, again, 150 times fewer parameters and about six times fewer operations. And what that does is, as I said before, running 50 frames per second with a camera resolution of 30 meter by 512, um, you, you take less than 20 milliwatts in a seven nanometer uh, process technology node for 50 frames per second. So this is really making sensors and hence processing of data from sensors much more capable at the edge at sensor. Um, this is not necessarily vision, but just to highlight, you know, this model is pretty versatile. It can be applied to any type of time series data. In this case, uh, we're talking about raw audio. Right? Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the traditional edge um, raw, uh, I mean, audio processing, which needs uh, front-end DSP filtering, FFTs, et cetera, going into a DSCNN. Accuracy gets to about 92% but it's 320 million max per second. With Akita and the TNN, uh, you could take the inputs directly from a, an ADC uh, or a PCM and feed it into the network. So you don't need additional filtering or DSP, which reduces DOM cost, makes it much more memory efficient. Accuracy actually goes up um, and the number of actual operations go down substantially. So in this case, it's well under two microjoules per inference in a 28 nanometer technology. So when you start thinking about visuals and uh, other time series like audio going alongside that, the combination is extremely effective, right? And it's effectively the same type of net model that's doing both types of things. Uh, just to extend that, uh, you know, with the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical uh, data set, uh, the goal behind this is to show reduced error. Again, we're trying to show precision here. Um, whatever is available on the market is not capable of delivering the root mean square error of less than one, which is what medical um, production quality requires. And, and the state-of-art algorithms like S4 are extremely compute intensive and, and large. So in this case with the TNN, we get well below the, the, the required uh, accuracy or required error uh, while taking 800 times fewer operations. So almost three orders of magnitude fewer operations to achieve the same thing, uh, an order of magnitude for fewer parameters and hence compactness of model. So as you can see, this is really capable as a model. And what we've done in terms of our architecture itself is we've built in 3D separable convolutions and uh, a, a storage, hidden storage capability within it to bring in all the benefits of RNNs, um, GRU type solutions while making these models substantially more compact.
So in terms of deployment, um, I, I'll just quickly run through it, right? So we have the ability to evaluate with our MetaTF software upfront without need for silicon. We've integrated into Edge and Pulse uh, as a platform. We have our own model zoo to support it. Um, a lot of uh, folks have taken our first generation chips and boxes to go build and design their prototypes and POCs. We have actual silicon-based uh, uh, solutions that people are developing for small volume. And then of course the IP can be used to build in fully integrated SOC solutions for um, production quality. And so to summary, um, brain chips really uh, quite taking the next step for radical vision solutions at the edge. You can do video object detection and untethered battery operated type devices, whether it's event-based cameras or frame-based cameras. And this can be extended to different types of time series data, including audio, remote health monitoring. Um, and then we have built it so that it can support today's complex models, ResNet 50 and up, um, as, the, as well as supporting tiny vision transformers uh, and we're working with the ecosystem to make that deployable. And at the same time, we can do a lot of this by minimizing the amount of training. And uh, as we customize on the field, like you know, not to need to do any more retraining in the cloud. All right, so that's what I had.